Coming up on Extraordinary Faith, we'll travel across the pond to London, England, one of the most exuberantly Catholic cities in the world. In our first of four London episodes, we'll visit Westminster Cathedral, where the parish administrator, himself a convert, and his assistant will give us background on this extraordinary house of worship. We'll join thousands of London Catholics in the annual Rosary Crusade procession through the busy streets of this great city. And we'll listen in on the renowned Westminster Cathedral Choir School, which sings a full choral mass every day of the week. Stay with us for a double-decker dose of Catholic tradition on Extraordinary Faith. Greetings, I'm Alex Began. Welcome to Extraordinary Faith, a program which travels the globe to celebrate the resurging interest in Catholic tradition. Today is the first of multiple episodes from London, England, one of my favorite cities on earth, and one which more than any other proudly embraces classic Catholic liturgy. While many people think of England as predominantly Anglican or secular in culture, and admittedly that is the case, there's also a thriving, unapologetically Catholic presence throughout the country, especially in its capital city. Our first stop is ground zero for Catholic liturgy in London, Westminster Cathedral. Perhaps the top spot for Catholic tourists to visit here is Westminster Cathedral. In a vast public square near Victoria Station, Westminster Cathedral is centrally located and welcomes visitors throughout the day. Canon Christopher Tuckwell is rector of the cathedral. Canon Tuckwell, we found it fascinating to learn that you were originally an Anglican priest. I was um, for just over 20 years. Now you're a Catholic priest and you go by the title of canon. What does it mean to be a canon? Every um, cathedral uh, has a chapter. The chapter is uh, composed of uh, priests who have been part of the diocese for a number of years um, and are probably within 15, 20 years of retirement. Uh, and they, they are chosen um, by the bishop. Uh, they're proposed by the other members of the chapter uh, and then appointed by the bishop. Uh, and the title canon uh, goes with membership of the chapter. There are numerous devotional chapels and side altars mm -hmm. along the side aisles. How do the faithful make use of those? I think many people have their own favorite chapel. I try and spend some time in all of them on a weekly rotation. Each of the chapels has its own particular character associated with its dedication and expressed in the artwork, the mosaics, the devotional works that are in there. When the cathedral was built, uh, every priest said his own mass. And there were, at that time, 20, even 25 chaplains here on the staff. So all those chapels would have been in use early in the morning, as each of the priests said their own mass. In these days of concelebration, the um, the individual altars don't get the use that they used to. But we celebrate Mass in all of those chapels uh, on, the, on their, the feast of, of the saint to which they're dedicated. In November, Holy Souls Chapel gets a lot of use. And the Lady Chapel uh, is used every day where the chaplains sing morning and evening prayer. Some of the occasional offices are are celebrated there, weddings, funerals, baptisms. Um, the Lady Chapel is, is the most used and the Blessed Sacrament Chapel is the most prayed in. From the moment the cathedral opens at 6.30 in the morning, people come into that chapel uh, to say their prayers. We have ad adoration um, uh, uh, every afternoon uh, and it's, it's 
beautiful to see the number of people who, who are in there saying their prayers. It really is the, the living heart, the praying heart of the cathedral, which makes it what it is. We've read that Pope Emeritus Benedict celebrated Mass here not too long ago. Yes, um, Pope Benedict came here in 2010 um, at the invitation uh, of Her Majesty the Queen and the British government. Uh, it wasn't a pastoral visit, which his predecessor, uh, Pope St. John Paul II, had made. Uh, it was a, a, a visit to the British Isles. Uh, but during the course of that visit, he celebrated Mass here, the Mass of our dedication, uh, the most precious blood. Give us an idea of what is offered here liturgically in a given week. In an ordinary day, um, we have six Masses at seven and eight, which are Masses principally for the early risers and those who are on their way to work. So they're said, um, and we, we aim not to uh, prolong the Mass because we're mindful of the fact that people have deadlines, they have to get into work, into their offices and things. At 10.30 uh, we have uh, a Mass in the ordinary form in Latin. That's every day. Uh, we have a 12.30 and a 1.05 lunchtime Masses for people who come out of their workplaces and who want to, to hear Mass and uh, Again, we're mindful of the fact that, they, that time is limited. Uh, and then at 5.30, uh, we have a sung mass, sung by the choir, um, part of it in English and part in Latin. Um, and that lasts for about an hour. That's fairly remarkable to have a sung mass <clears throat> with full choir almost every day of the every week? Every day, yes. There, there may not be another church in the world that can claim that. Um, there may indeed, there may not be. It is part of our tradition and, uh, and it's very proudly upheld. We understand that Westminster Cathedral was one of the only churches in the world to host the extraordinary forum from 1971 till the early 80s. Yes, um, I'm not very well versed on the history of that, but I, I know that um, Cardinal Heenan made a particular request from Rome that we be permitted to, uh, to continue to celebrate the extraordinary form. And I know that the Latin Mass Society show their appreciation uh, of Cardinal Heenan by laying a wreath of flowers uh, on his grave um, uh, once a year when they come for one of their, their solemn liturgies. And those liturgies are requiem masses? No, they have a requiem uh, in, in November and a sung mass at some other time in the year. Twice a month uh, there's a celebration um, uh, in, in uh, the Lady Chapel of, the, uh, of, of mass in the extraordinary form. Tell us about the school that's associated with the cathedral. The Westminster Cathedral Choir School was founded and, and is a choir school. And originally it was intended to be just that, a school for the choristers, uh, who, who boys who were selected because of their musical ability, their singing ability, uh, who came to uh, live here, to board here, uh, and were trained uh, as choristers and who, who uh, when they were f fully qualified, they sang with the choir each day at the liturgy. There are, I think, 32 choristers and, and they still live here. They board uh, in the school. But s since then, the, the school has been expanded uh, and, and we have a number of day boys uh, bringing the school uh, population up to about 160. The day boys uh, receive the same education as the choristers, except of course they're not, they, they don't do the, the choral training and singing. Uh, and boys leave here at 13 and go on to a variety of, uh, of other schools, major schools in, in the country.
We also notice that confession is offered in the cathedral every day. Yes, celebration of, of confessional, the rite of reconciliation, is one of the most important works of the cathedral. Each day from 11.30 until 6.30 in the evening, uh, there is a priest, sometimes two, even on occasions three, available for confessions. And people come from all over the diocese, and from south of the river and from all over the place. They come here, I think, because they know that there's always a priest here um, and that uh, there's a degree of anonymity uh, about coming here. Um, it's, it's a great work uh, and, and it's a huge privilege for us who, who are chaplains here uh, to, to celebrate uh, the, the, the rite of confession. We hear some, well, some extraordinary um, and remarkable uh, confessions and, and uh, it, 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 it just is it's so tied up with the life and work of the cathedral. People don't have to go all over the place. They, they can come here, the cathedral, the bookshops, it's all here. And of course, uh, uh, the, the cathedral kitchen, where they can get their refreshments afterwards. Very important. Well, lastly, what would you recommend that a tourist to London visit when they come to the cathedral? I would recommend, first of all, a visit to the Blessed Sacrament. There are some beautiful mosaics, uh, as well as the significance of saying a prayer before the Lord in the Eucharist. If they desire or if they need, then they should make use of the confessional. They should go and visit the shrine of our martyr saint, St. John Southworth, and read his history. And remember that Catholics went through a very hard time a time of suffering and, and uh, difficulty for many hundreds of years in this country between the Reformation and the restoration of the hierarchy. And then I would suggest a visit to the tower. Go up the cathedral tower. You have one of the best views all over London. You can look down into the gardens of Buckingham Palace or you can look right across to South London or to the North London hills. Very good, Canon Tuckwell. Thank you so much for giving us this background on this lovely church. Thank you. You're very welcome, Alex. Dylan Perry is Westminster Cathedral's Director of Communications. Dylan, promoting everything that goes on here must be a dazzling responsibility. How do you get the word out? It is quite a responsibility in some ways. We have a very old magazine in Westminster Cathedral. It's one of the oldest Catholic magazines in the world. In fact, there was a magazine here before there was a cathedral. Uh, the magazine was here to promote the yet-to-be cathedral, so we've been promoting Westminster Cathedral even before it was built. So now we're kind of continuing in that vein since 1895. London is a fairly unique city encompassing two dioceses and numerous parishes offering superb liturgy. How does the cathedral stand out? Well, I guess it's um, part of a grand tradition of other churches offering glory to God through beauty and reverence. But the cathedral has an advantage in that she is the mother church for all Catholics in England and Wales. Lots of people come here every day. We have, I don't know, about 800 people come to Mass, weekday Mass. And thousands come on a Sunday. Because everyone knows that this is the place in central London where it all happens. And there's that history to it. You know, it was set up, the cathedral is meant to be like the new Canterbury for the Catholic Church. So it's the seat of the Archbishop of Westminster. It's right next to Parliament. And we have a wonderful choir. And I think we're the only Catholic cathedral in the world to have a sung mass and sung vespers every day. People often stop me and say, well, what about St. Peter's in Rome? Surely they have it. But of course, they're not a cathedral, but I don't actually know if they do have it, but we have sung mass and vespers every day with a magnificent choir, so, you know. And confessions, six hours a day, if not more. So people come here all the time. It's like a huge shrine and a huge cathedral. 
Tell us about Cardinal Heenan's tomb. Well, just before he died, Cardinal Heenan was really keen to be buried under the 12th station of the cross here. And he's buried there. And once a year, people from the Latin Mass Society come and lay flowers on his tomb in thanksgiving for the fact that he, as I often say, he saved the old Mass in many ways, the traditional Latin Mass. So anyway, Cardinal Heenan went to see Paul VI with this petition and he said, Your Holiness, you know, the people of England and Wales are very concerned that they are able to celebrate the traditional Mass of ages. And His Holiness said, fine, well, you know, who are these people? And he said, well, there's a petition here, Your Holiness, and all these various names of people who are very concerned, non-Catholics and Catholics alike. And the story goes, and Heenan himself reported this, that Paul VI was going through the list and he came down and he was going, oh yes, Cardinal Sir, no. oh, evil in war, well, you expect him. Uh -huh. And he came to one name and he went, Agatha Christie. He said, Agatha Christie? And Heenan said, yes, Your Holiness, Agatha Christie. And apparently the Pope turned to him and said, you have an indult. And he was such a fan of Agatha Christie's that she, in effect, saved the continuation of the old mass. That it wasn't completely abrogated in that sense, or it continued. Think about the Catholic parish whose music program impresses you the most. How often does their choir sing a major polyphonic mass? A few times per year? At Westminster Cathedral, a polyphonic mass and or vespers are sung almost every day of the year. Here to explain how this is all possible is the director of music, Martin Baker. Martin, first off, tell us what sort of music is offered in a typical week here. The choir sings every day uh, throughout the week, and as you mentioned, uh, most days it's Vespers and Mass. Uh, the choir consists of men and boys, and they will either sing together or separately. So on a Tuesday, only the boys sing. On a Wednesday, only the men sing. Uh, on the other days, the, the masses are full choir, both the boys and the men singing together. Um, and the vespers on the weekdays are sung by the men alone. And on Sunday afternoons, it's the whole choir which sings vespers. Are the men professional singers? That's right. The men are professional singers. We have a total of 10 uh, in total on a Sunday, two altos, four tenors and four basses and they join the choristers who are educated here at the Cathedral Choir School. And tell us what sort of pieces the choir sings. The whole music program is based in Gregorian chant. That's the starting point for any Mass or any Vespers. Indeed, if you come to a, a Vespers, which is normally at 5 p.m. on a weekday and is in the Lady Chapel, you will hear only Gregorian chant until the Magnificat begins when the men of the choir will sing a faux on setting. Uh, at Mass, the choir begins every uh, Mass with the introit, which is sung to Gregorian chants taken from the, uh, the, the graduale, the correct introit of the day. And they sing this processing in from the sacristy through the nave and up here to the, the apse where, where the choir sings. Uh, so the chant really is the foundation point of, of everything we do. But on top of that, we sing a polyphonic mass setting uh, every day, and we will also sing motets at the offertory and communion. Uh, the choir's core repertoire is centered in the composers of the Counter-Reformation, uh, Renaissance, Polyphony, Palestrina, Victoria, Guerrero, or closer to home, Bird, Talis, Taverner, and so on. Tell us about the choir school. What sort of ages of boys does it serve? The boys at the choir school uh, arrive age eight and they leave when they're 13. So it's a typical English prep school. Uh, and they can come from all over the country because they actually live here at the school. In, in order to uh, perform and, and fulfill the, the 
complicated and extended duties of a chorister, um, it's necessary for them to, to live here on site. Are the prospective students auditioned? They're all auditioned. I normally hear uh, each boy twice. They'll come in formally, first of all, with their families to have a look around, sing to me something very simple and straightforward. I'll test whether they have a good ear. We're, we're looking really for that kind of um, oral ability as opposed to the finished product at that stage. And the boys can be as young as six when they first come. Uh, and depending on how that goes, I'll invite them back for a second audition, a more formal audition, and they have to uh, take some academic tests at the school. And the final hurdle is a sleepover, where they'll actually spend a couple of nights with the other choristers just to check that they, um, they can fit in socially. Clearly the boys don't arrive knowing everything, so what sort of training do they receive here? Well, you're, you're right, they, they do arrive uh, from many different uh, stages and uh, quite often a, a boy will know very little, if, if, if no, nothing at all, just have the oral ability. So um, they spend their first year here, uh, we call them probationers, having separate classes from the other boys every morning. They go with the assistant director of music uh, to, to learn all of the basics which they need, um, all the fundamentals, musical notation, both in modern notation and in Gregorian notation. Um, they, it's really important that they learn to sight sing, that they don't just copy the other boys and sing along. They have to be able to read the music because we sing so much of it every week. Um, and we like them also to understand the liturgy and, and the, the whole context of, of what they're doing. Uh, and I also like to say that the first thing we teach them, and perhaps the hardest thing, is how to do nothing. Uh, because little kids are, are quite fidgety. And so um, for their first year, the probationers come here into mass most evenings and uh, they will stand in front of the choir as we sing. And they, they don't actually have anything to do. And I think it takes quite a lot of focus on their part just to, to relax, be calm, not to distract anybody, but to absorb everything that's going on. It's a very important part of their learning. I've noticed by looking at your music schedule that you have a tremendous repertoire of masses. How many masses do the boys learn in a, a given year? Well, in our library, um, we've got uh, approaching 200 polyphonic mass settings in, in regular use um, and quite a lot more in the reserve library and several hundred motets. Now, obviously, they don't have all of those on the go all of the time. Um, what I like to think of is that they have a, a repertoire of ethereal music, which, which we can use during the week, um, which is shorter and appropriate for a weekday mass, and which is less taxing musically. And then we program the, the bigger pieces for the weekends, for the Sundays, for the big feasts as well. And uh, so those, that, that bigger repertoire will come around less often. Um, so they, they know a lot of music and they know it on different levels. Thank you, Martin. Now let's take a peek at one of your rehearsals before a weekday mass. London tends to do things on a grand scale. Think of concerts in Hyde Park, the London Eye Ferris Wheel, and the 2012 Olympics. Catholic events take center stage in the life of the city, too. In commemoration of October as the month of the Rosary, a grand procession takes place every year along the main streets of London, from Westminster Cathedral to the London Oratory. 
an estimated 2,000 people participate, turning the busy Saturday retail scene into an amazing witness to Marian devotion. The Catholic Police Guild, an association that likely wouldn't exist elsewhere, guards the statue of Our Lady during the procession. We're from the Catholic Police Guild. Um, Catholic Police Guild is a, an association, a national association uh, of, uh, from England and Wales, police officers from, from all over England and Wales. And uh, we help with the procession here. Uh, and our, our, our role is to carry Our Lady. Uh, so, and we've done that now for a number of years. Um, and uh, we're very happy to do so. We have uh, at the, one at the moment in the region of about 200, 250 members. Uh, and, and fortunately, it's growing all of the time. The event concludes with benediction as throngs of the faithful fill every nook and cranny of the oratory. next episode, we'll visit one of the most famous churches in the world for traditional Catholic liturgy, the London Oratory. One of its priests explains the history of the congregation of the oratory that serves the parish, and why the sacred liturgy is such a focus. We'll discover the impressive music program of the professional adult choir that sings at Sunday Mass and Vespers. We'll learn about the three children's choirs at the church, including the globe-trotting Schola Cantorum of the London Oratory School. And we'll listen in on the Oratory Junior Choir as they sing for a weekly benediction service. There's more information about every place and person we visit on our website, extraordinaryfaith.tv. Please contact us there and like us on Facebook where you can ask questions and comment along with our growing body of viewers. Thanks for accompanying us on our journey to England, and join us next time as we continue our travels through London in our second episode in Great Britain, here on Extraordinary Faith. <laughs>